like I just got ambushed by this information. And just like <laughs> fries the guy like that, I'm not after my way or the highway. It's very easy for me to be an arrogant little jerk. You'd love to hate the guy at times. Seeing the words on the page was enough to get me into the headspace of what he has to sound like. You're watching convention coverage. Um, yeah, things are good, actually. I have been very warmly greeted by the Friday crowd here uh, at SAC Anime, and I've never been to an anime convention. I did have somebody bring up something from Scryed. Uh, I played Ryoho and Scryed, which is a, a anime series, because obviously it's SAC Anime, and I actually started my career out doing anime, so I just Ooh. haven't done it for a long time. Uh, so a lot of the series that were, you know, are popular and more recent. Yes. You know, uh, but yeah, actually, everybody's been kind and sweet. That's and good. Nice, which is excellent. We usually have a pretty good crowd. I mean, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see or anything online about what it was like to be a part of Arcane and what it was like. It took it was like a six six year process. I think I came in at year five, and one of the nice things about the creative team over at Riot Games is that they're incredibly involved in the process. So when I was doing so though, and this is for the right folks out there first, obviously, um, I was alone in the booth by myself. There were no other actors. I didn't get a chance to interact with Mia who plays Powder or JB who plays Vander or any of that. Um, and the creative uh, creators, Christian and Link and Alex Lee, they, for the pilot, they actually sat in the booth with me which was, is very different. Usually as an actor, everybody's on the other side of the glass and they shut you in a room and you're by yourself and you do your thing. They actually came into the room because they really wanted to make sure that I understood the way that they saw Silco. So um, we started with the monologue from the beginning of episode three. Do you ever wonder what it's like to drown? There's peace in water. Like it's holding you, whispering in low tones to let it in, and every problem in the world will fade away. And we would start with this, this that was also the audition monologue, by the way. And we just kind of hone in on what it was, you know, where they wanted Silco to live, because, you know, many animated shows, they, I don't want to say they, they push things, but they tend to hit the emotional gas very frequently, and... One of the lovely things about Christian and Alex's view of Silco was that he's not a typical villain. He's much more soft-spoken. They likened him like his, like to smoke in a way that he just kind of wraps his way through everybody that he needs to manipulate and then eventually just gets out of them what he wants. So uh, it was a beautiful creative process and very collaborative, which it isn't always in voiceover. Sometimes they hear your voice and they're like, just come and do your thing and they'll give you some direction. But it was a, it was a beautiful collaborative process. And then for every time thereafter, after we did the pilot, there was about a year and a half gap. And then we, the series got greenlit and we started recording episodes. Every time we would start recording, my sound check would be that monologue. And I would do the whole thing just to get into the vibe, the headspace of Silco. Um, you know, and it, it, it works. It definitely was an incredible process to also go through, take Silco through the changes that happen, you know, because he starts a man with a point of view and nothing will get in his way, and then a man and a point of view with a daughter, which is a very different life, you know. So, uh, yeah. Doing Arcane was a singularly beautiful creative experience. It was pretty awesome. It's, it's visually stunning, too. It is. The animations. Um, yeah, Fortiche. The artists at Fortiche were just the most gifted and talented artists that I've ever had a privilege to voice something that came out of this living artwork. Every frame in Arcane, you could stop it, and it's, you know, uh, worthy of hanging on your wall. So, yeah, Fortiche, they're incredible they're also incredibly French, you know. <laughs> so anytime we'd be at a party or anything, they'd be halfway off their, you know. And it, it, but the creative process that they go through was very similar. You know, they would just workshop this stuff until it all felt 100% right. 
or it's just uh, so when they decided to bring back Razor for Young Justice in season four. Yes. I assume they just approached you about that. Was that because the creative people from GLTAS had been involved with Young Justice now, or did they just come up with it out of the blue? No. What's really interesting is Greg Wiseman, the creator of Gargoyles mm -hmm. and the creator of Young Justice, uh, co-creator of Young Justice, yeah. yeah. He loved the story of Razor and Aya from Green Lantern, the animated series. And he, he basically said, if there's any way at all possible for me to bring back Razor, I will. And that was very early. That was like season two, Young Justice. He said this to me because, you know, Green Lantern, the animated series, got canceled a long time ago. He softened the US so, because he was going to kill you. So, right. So, <laughs> so at San Diego Comic-Con, where they announced that Young Justice was coming back for season three, mm -hmm. brought back, um, we were there. We were in the audience. And after they had the announcement and everybody went the crazy. The crowd went bananas. The crowd went bananas. Yeah. And they, we're walking outside and Greg pulls me aside and he pulls me behind like a column that's just there, you know, outside the friggin' ballroom. And he goes, hey man, I'm bringing Razor back. I'm like, why? Like I just got ambushed by this information. And so this was that long ago. I think that was 2019. And as I had to keep it a secret from 2019. And, but... It was a passion for him. He just really loved the story so much. And that's you know, why he gave it the arc uh, that he did to complete, not complete, but just to further raise his story. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm a very, very fortunate person. You know, I, very, I have a, an attitude of gratefulness when it comes to things like that, that creators have a, a passion that is so strong that they want to bring a character back that I you know, created the voice for. It's, it's such a compliment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, good question. Yeah, good question. Speaking of bringing back characters, are you training your voice in case someone asks you to reprise your role as Avon from Valkyria Chronicles 2? You know what? First of all, I'm always training my voice. <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly using it and always training. And if anybody, if they asked me to do that, I would love to do that. I would, here's the thing. I'm not going to say that all my voices are my babies. But it's sort of like that. You spend your time, you're creating them, you're helping people tell a story, whether it's a video game or animated series, it's all a story. And then when you're done, it's kind of like, oh, I don't get to do that anymore. So you, of course, if you got another chance, the answer is always yes. So, so uh, yes, I'm, I'm training. Nice, no, thank you. Yeah, of course, thanks for the question. The Green Lantern animated series is one of my favorite like animated DC series of all time. Thank I'm actually you. in the process of rewatching it for like the second or third time right now. <laughs> Thank you. That's a huge compliment because um, the yeah. writing is also very brilliant. It's yes, a great it show. Um, I just wanted to know what was your favorite moment or line that you acted out as Razor? What, my, there are two. Mm, I really loved when Razor blasted Atrocitus after he found out the information that, you know, your precious Ilana, you know, and Atrocitus says that and he just goes, Rah! he just like fries the guy like that. That I love that moment. Obviously, that's just me screaming into the microphone. So it's not, you know, it's me raging out, which was fun. Every time Razor raged out, I just loved it. Um, there's a story, there's a piece of the story when Razor descends into the torture of the spiders and he's being mentally tortured by a memory that is painful for him. And that's what the spiders do. They mm -hmm. torture him by using his own memories to do so. And Aya populates the program and goes inside to speak with him and says, you know, Razor, I'm not part of this program. I'm here, you know, blah. And Razor's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. I like being here. Even though it's painful, I like being in this memory because I get to see my precious Ilana again. His even precious if wife even if only for a moment. Like, you know, he's got this sort of thing where he's in love with, you know, his dead fiance, his dead wife, and he, even if the memory is painful, he's happy to be there. So, and it was actually part of the audition. I'm not about to take orders from a computer, you know, and, and he says, you know, yeah. uh, go back to whatever hard drive you call home and bother me no more, you know. And then he, at the end, 
uh, of that scene, uh, Aya says something about, you know, why are you here? And this is too painful for you, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, pray you never do. Because he says, pray you never know what it's like to have pain because you're just a computer. It's actually really cool. So I like that scene a lot. Yeah, I liked it too. Yeah. I really like the relationship of Aya and Razor. Yeah, and it's fascinating the confusion that it goes through. It's so well written because then Aya takes the form, a physical form of his, you know, dead love of his life. And he's <laughs> yeah. like confronted with the physical form of the dead love of his life that isn't really them. And then when he gets possessed with uh, uh, the orange lantern, help me. Larflees. Yeah, Larflees. I is misinterpreting his signals towards her back as in he's making romantic advances, which he's not. And it was so, it's just a, a lovely love story that just felt like they were, f you know, fumbling their way into being in love with each other. It, it, it's, it's fascinating and beautiful story. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And they did bring back the writers, by the way. Jim Krieg, uh, they had him on Young Justice to, to write the episodes for Young Justice because he's super talented. I'm just curious about your voice for OS, Soko and Arcane. He's yeah. a, he's got, Soko's got a really, he's a really unique character, but he's also got a really unique voice. So I was just sure. curious on how did you come up with the voice for Soko and Arcane? Right, well my, my process was pretty simple and I think it's just a matter of, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. So the audition consisted of that monologue that he starts episode three with. At the time it actually started the pilot, it was actually the first words ever heard in the show, but they rearranged it after they'd made it into a series. And just reading the words on the page was enough to get me into the headspace of what he has to sound like. So, do you ever wonder what it's like to drown? It's this sort of thoughtful, aloof, you know, that he's just got his gears turning, but at the same time, you know, you, he's not overly, excuse me, he's not overly evil or plotting or any of that. It's just sort of like, you know, still taste the salt. Like, like, why would you say that? Why would you say out loud that you can still taste the salt from when you were being drowned in the lake by your best friend? Like, wh why would you say that you still taste the salt? Because he, he's always playing chess and everyone else is playing checkers, right? So to be a person like that, I mean, you, you, you have to be very relaxed. The voice can't be pushed and say those things and sound believable. So honestly, the words on the page just informed me because I didn't have any artwork. They, didn't, they, they actually did the artwork after they cast me, which is why it kind of resembles me in a way. And then when I went in to be with Christian and Alex for the first recording, they were like asking me to just make sure that I you know, kept him pulled back, kept him relaxed, throw lines away, just reminding me that that was what they wanted. So I would say vocal tone you know, was all just from my own imagination and I kind of got it right away. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course, man. Um, what was your favorite souvenir that Wally got to take? The helmet of fate. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's sort of like a moment that he's confronted with in that episode. He's really confronted with, he was playing around a lot and being the Wally who, you know, was still after Megan and doing this stuff. But the end of that episode is very serious, like someone dies. And for a second, Wally's removed from this world and is trapped, right? Like it gets a little serious. And so to me... The Helmet of Fate sort of represents almost like the first step in the change who we see who Wally is that allows him to go on his journey and be in love with Artemis and things like that. Because it's also the first time we see Spitfire, right? So it, it's the first time you hear the word. Yeah. You know, when Nelson says, you know, find your own little Spitfire, you know? And it's like, well, that is the introduction of Spitfire. So to me, that helmet represents that stuff. So I, you know, it's a personal choice. What's your favorite souvenir? Um, probably the heart attack, like the, the heart transplant. Yeah, yeah. I love cold hearted. It's oh. one of my favorite episodes. Don't get me wrong, but I had to pick a souvenir that, yeah. yeah so I'm, it's close tie, I guess. Yeah. yeah I just rewatched his 
spoiler alert, uh, he deep, like, disintegrates. Uh, so I'm rewatching it with my friend, yeah. and I just, I knew it, and I looked at it, and I was like, I'm still bitter that we have Lagan, yeah. who I want to be Lagan, but yeah. Wally's gone? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thank you. Just tell mom and dad, just, oh, Artemis is so going to kill me for this. Oh. Yeah, sorry. That was terrible and rude. Uh, so I had a question about Silco. Was your favorite line the yeah. um, the monologue, or did you have other Don't lines cry. that you really? Oh. You're perfect. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. I never would have given you to them, not for anything. Yeah. That, so the end of the show is very hard to trump because it's ultimately. You have a lot of questions about Silco, right? You can question his motivations. Is he using Jinx to achieve his motives? And all is, is, is Jinx only somebody who he sees as a means to an end, right? There's all these questions that are circulating around in your brain. And even in Jinx's brain, when he's sitting there going, they didn't even haggle, you know? And, and Jinx is behind the statue hearing him say this. And in, her, in their mind, Jinx is like, well, wait a minute. Does he really care about me? I don't know, right? And as an audience, up until that last moment, I think there's unanswered questions for people. Not for me as the actor who plays Soko. Obviously, I knew that, you know, Jinx changed, Powder changed Soko as a person, you know, to allow him to be a little bit better version of himself. And he was still working on that right up until the end. But that he says it in that moment. There's, there's no reason for him to keep pretending in that moment if it was pretend. It, it wasn't. That he just says... I never would have given you to them, not for anything. Because there's no way. He would not have given Jinx up. People are like, he would have just given Jinx up. I'm like, no way. And he would have got the Nation of Zon too. It's Silco, dude. He would have had the 10,000 things in his back pocket. Don't cry made me cry. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I cried when I performed it and when I read it and when I watched it. And so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's so many good lines. Betrayal, that pain that you feel could eat you up from the inside out. Can either break you or fold you into something greater. So many good lines. Because the writers are brilliant. The writers of Arcane are masters. Yes. I mostly wanted to ask regarding Silco. Yeah. How did you feel of playing the antagonist of the story? Mm -hmm. Of that profound of a story? Yeah. And are you sad that you're done? I think the antagonist there? of that story is oppression, I don't think it's Silco. I think there's lots of forms of that. I think there's a lot of forms of oppression in the show. If you look at it, it's people that are... That's why the very end of the season where he says, don't cry, you're perfect. It's the acceptance of that person for who they are as a person, right? And there's a lot of that. If you look at the relationships right? Vander tried to kill Silco because of who he was and his motivations and the way he was executing a plan that Vander didn't agree with. So Vander oppressed Silco, right? Caitlin's parents oppress Caitlin, right? Even Vi oppressed Powder because wouldn't let them come along, right? So I think the main villain of Arcane is the theme of oppression. That's just my interpretation as an actor. I'm sure there's many. It's a beautiful story. So I don't see Silco as a villain. He's just a hero with a different set of priorities. I agree. I just, I just meant like if there was one uh, actual person that you had to put as the antagonist, it would have to be him. But I agree that there's no real villains. And then my last question is, are you sad that you won't be able to play him anymore? Yeah, of course. As I said before, they're all my babies. So not getting a chance to play Wally or Razor or and obviously Silco is an incredible gift as an actor for me to receive. The beautiful writing, the incredible artwork, the flawless music, the, you know, everything in it is. So for me to not get a chance to do that anymore is a sense of sadness for me. But also, you know, when you're done playing Hamlet, you're done. And that was your version of Hamlet. That's who you, you were, and that's it. You know, later on in life, you play King Lear. So it, it's sort of like a moment in your life where you say, oh, man, I, I never get to be 23 again, right? You won't, but that's what life is. Life is a series of moments connected together that you can never repeat. So enjoy them while they're in front of you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, and I hope that you voice another character sometime in the series as it goes on. <laughs> that would be nice. I mean, yeah. I mean, I do have a pretty flexible uh, vocal repertoire. So uh, here's hoping they don't just see me as Silco, but you never know. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. If you could choose one role, like in the beginning of your career, yeah. what would that role have been? At the beginning of my career, I really wanted to play the Joker. The Joker? Because Silco didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then I got to play the Joker in Batman Hush. So. Nice. Yeah. You ready for a Joker laugh? Go for it. <laughs> Very well done. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that, that I got to play the Joker in Batman Hush. No. It's a very well-written graphic novel, and they did a great job adapting it to the screen. It's not easy. Ernie, the writer, brilliant, and uh, it was pretty, pretty faithfully done and well done. I thought it was pretty well done. The alley scene is one of my favorite scenes as an actor that I got to do. I don't know if you guys have seen Batman Hush. I have. Yeah? You should. Did you know I was the Joker? Yes. Oh. <laughs> That's right, I was the Lego Joker. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm one of those stealthy, stealthy voice actors. What has he done? So between everything that you've been through, I mean, heroes, villains, anti-heroes, such as, I sure. guess you probably throw Razor and, and Silco into that. I mean, yeah, you, you can. Do you, do you have a preference of what you prefer to play? I do prefer to play the villain who has redeemable qualities as opposed to the good guy who has... A complicated backstory, right? So, like, I would describe, like, Batman is the villain with a complicated backstory, right? The dark hero. Um, I prefer to play the villain that has some form of redeeming quality that it's hard to hate. I think, me as an actor, I, I prefer that. I would love to play Batman. I've said so in public. I'd love to do that. But, um, you know, whatever comes through the mail slot, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. This is as long as you're working, right? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know, Alfred. You tell me. So, yeah. We'll see. So, what qualities do you prefer in a voice director? Oh, I think the ability to collaborate, right? Because I, I don't think that the di dictatorial nature of directing the word sounds really dictatorial. Like, we're going to direct you. We're going to tell you what to do. I think voice directors that understand that we're collaborating, we're collaborate, collaborating to tell a story, I think get the best result. And ultimately what I'm after as an actor is the best result. I'm after the best version of my performance to tell this story. I'm not after my way or the highway. I'm not after what I thought was a good idea for the scene. I'm not after any of that. I'm after what ultimately would have been the best way to tell this story. And oftentimes, you know, voice directors that are open to experimentation and collaboration even surprise themselves what they get out of things. So I think that's my, my favorite trait. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, of course, Scott. Thanks for asking You're going to get props for spouting out obscure roles of yours. 20 so. points goes to... Uh, Keo from Zatch Bell. Keo from Zatch Bell. Anybody yeah. here watch Zatch Bell? Yeah, that well, was a show that sort of... Zach here! Yeah, it got cut short here in the West, but what you were talking right. about with the... Uh, anti-heroes versus anti-villains thing got me thinking sure. that Keo, he's kind of a jerk. Keo kind of a is, huge jerk. Keo is a huge jerk ball. <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah. he's such an enormous jerk yeah. that he kind of resents the fact that he's a good person. Yeah. I was wondering if yeah. there was I, anything to channeling that in the, in the it, role. No, it's just me being a young jerk actor, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, Keo is, uh, yeah, he was, it was fun. It was like one of the first anime roles that I did. I mean, it was... Uh, I was also the lead kid in uh, Transformers R.I.D. Yeah, Koji, Robots whatever his name Koji, is. yeah. Um, so those are my anime creds. Yeah. Uh, and Zatch Bell was hilarious to do. I mean, anytime you're talking about Yellowtail and throwing out spells and yeah. doing, you know, having fun with Debbie Derryberry, like, it's just fun. So, yeah, it was a good time. And I, it was very easy for me to be an arrogant little jerk <laughs> back when I was, whatever it was, 22. Yeah. Back when I was 22, it was very easy for me to be a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Before you had a daughter who dyed your hair. Yes, exactly. <laughs> before, I, before I had a daughter who dyed my hair. Yeah, I uh, watched Clone Wars conversation. My babies. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I got to hang out with James Arnold Taylor for that. It was yeah. a lot of fun. And uh, 
Clone Wars, I always thought it was interesting that Lux had the possibility to come back in some of the new Star Wars animated shows that were flirting with that, like Rebels and things. And yeah. Dave just, I don't think he liked Lux as a character. Uh, I thought he found him a little foppish and just didn't like him. So I well, don't know if we'll see Lux. Everyone's wrong. This is a hollow trace device. It'll lead us straight to Count Dooku. Is that enough of a plan for you? No, I definitely think Lux and also like Barris were two characters that totally could have come back for Rebels. I agree. I think it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Oh, well. Thanks, man. We never Thanks. in the show, I feel like we never heard Silco like genuinely really happy mm -hmm. talking. Yeah. Would, what, would, what would be the way that you would voice that? If he was in a real, like at a party celebrating, I don't know, getting <laughs> Nation of Zaun, something like that. Yeah, it'd probably sound just like him, only slightly happier. I mean, it would just really, you know, we finally did it. We've got the nation of Zom. Isn't that something? That's, that's how he would be happy. The reason is because you can't rewind Silco's life and not have the horrible events happen to him, the, him that did, right? So even in his happiness, that he, I mean, he's led such a tortured life. He, you know, his best friend betrayed him. He's sacrificed a lot of things, a lot of his morality to bring about this dream of the nation of Zon for the people of the lands. And, you know, that, that just leaves marks on you on the inside and the outside, you know? So it, it's, I think that that's how he would sound. What you just heard is just like, that's the happiest the dude gets, man. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, I know it's- Three perfect. cheers, Vanda. You know, like, there's no way. It's just that how happy he would be, yeah. Which version of Wally slash Kid Flash do you like playing the most, whether it's You've oh, you mean like season one versus season two versus... Yeah, two. of Young Justice, of like, which season of Wally? Season one like? Wally is my favorite to play. Okay, season two Wally, it's complicated and a bit older, and, you yeah. know, which is, which is fine. It has its own merits, you know, you know. But season one Wally was just so much fun, you know. The Wall Man is here! It just, like, falls on his face, you know. Kid Flash, never heard of you. Like, it, there's just so many moments for him to be, you'd love to hate the guy at times, you know, and then you get to see him be really compassionate and you see him forget his memory and be like, you know, I am not touching that with a 10 foot pole. All right, they've got bigger arrows. And like, he just picks up Artemis because he forgets that they fight, you know, and still not giving her the satisfaction. Like, there's just so much fun interaction between them. I just love season one Wally. So. Yeah, I definitely like how sassy yeah. um, Wally can be in season It's one. a great word. Sassy. sassy. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, do you have any advice you can give an aspiring voice actor like me? Yeah. Um, I would say that the key word, and my buddy JB is fond of saying this, there are no actors. A voice actors is only actors. So learning to act like he went to Ramda, the school in you know London, and I was classically trained as an actor. Learning the craft of acting, I think, if you truly want to be on a show like Young Justice, where they're telling you know complex, real narratives, you know, uh, you have to have acting chops. So I would st strongly recommend either taking you know, acting classes or however you best find the ability to tell stories acting to make sure that you have that part of your craft you know, developed. I really would. Because if, you know, we don't just talk into microphones. That's not the reason why it sounds the way it sounds. It's the reason why Young Justice is good is because the acting is good, really. So that would be my advice. And I think, you know, <laughs> specifically, People like Greg Wiseman who write great stories, they hire good actors to tell them. They, they don't hire good voice actors. They want to find the best actors to tell the stories. So I think, I think that's good advice. Sound advice, anyway. <laughs> How you get into voice acting uh, these days, I have no clue. <laughs> it's so different now with like YouTube and everything. So. I was inspired by you legends. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Looking forward to season five of Young Justice? Yes. You are now part of Forager's Hive. So, I also play Forager. 
Thanks, man. Is, how did it feel to go from when you were playing Wally West, a more comedic character, more fun character, sure. um, into a much more episode focused, um, serious when in Cold Hearted when he had to go deliver the heart? Well, it was interesting because one thing we talked about, Greg and Brandon and I, you know, we never wanted Wally to be one dimensional because he's not obviously written that way. You get to see a lot more like when all the parents get, you know, sucked away and there he is taking care of kids and you get to see the softer side of Wally. So that it's very important that you see a side of him that we've seen in people we know. So there are people we know who use that sort of sassy, silly sense of humor to cover up their sort of tenderness, right? And so that was a chance for us to show that part of Wally that, you know, is really tender and serious and, you know, on mission because he knows somebody is counting on him and things like that and not, you know, dressing up in beach volleyball and showing up and, you know, like an opportunity to show you that Wally is a real person in this story rather than just what you see in cartoons sometimes, one dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that was one of the early opportunities for us to do that in season one. And, you know, you also see him getting very emotional with Dick, you know, when he's scared to death that Artemis is gonna be discovered. You know, you see, you, you start to see these pieces of what it's, what a real human being, not just a sassy mouth superhero. And yeah, it, it, what was it like as an actor? It was actually refreshing because you don't wanna be playing the same thing the whole time. You really want the audience to connect with your character as if it's a real person. And those are great opportunities to do it. So I love those chances actually. Yeah, it's right. a good question. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Cheers.